Good morning, good afternoon, good night. I'm Black Bright and I'm broadcasting out of the UK, around the world, and welcome to my channel. First time passing through, please hit the like button if you like what I'm going to say. You put the down button if you don't like what I'm talking about. And you subscribe if you think what I'm talking about could benefit someone else or you just think somebody else might want to have a comment on it. Uh, for my existing subscribers, welcome and thank you for your support and sticking with me. Now today is a controversial topic. Um, I was sent a, a video about a Rasta and he was talking about all the reasons why God doesn't exist. And so what I thought I would do is, at first when I listened to it, I thought to myself, well, he has a point. And then I thought to myself, well, he's probably saying everything that other people say. I've got a piece of hair here in my face. Yeah, he's probably saying everything that people are thinking, especially in these times. This is really distracting. But anyway, um, he's probably saying everything that other people are saying. Um, so I thought I would go through it. What I think I do is because it's a bit long, it's 10 minutes. I think I'll interject and have my thoughts about what he says so it doesn't seem as though you're just listening to him and then you lose what he says or I lose what he says and then it just goes out in the air. So I'll be pausing it and starting it and stopping it, putting my two cents worth in and I hope you find it interesting. Okay, and for those of you who are not Jamaican, you might struggle, but hopefully you'll get the gist of what he's saying. Let me show you the simple self. They give you, say, from your bond or from you know yourself, they tell you, say, one man up in the sky is coming to save you from all of your problems and all of the chaos that you find in life. That one man. So everybody, look, look, when you think about it, millions, if not billions of persons, then you know, why can't we wait for Jesus come? I can't wait for this man come out of the sky because this man is going to rescue me and he is not going to be no evil no more. And you see what they create in your mind, they create a thing in your mind, you know, that you're not going to do anything to change that situation from what is created in your mind. Because every day you're thinking that when Jesus come, all of this is going to change. Instead, if every man was looking to say, you know what, what can I do to change the plight or the situation that I find myself into? This is what I'm saying. Okay. So what he's talking about is when um, I think it's a lot of, the older generation, um, there are young people who take um, the Bible literally. But I think what that is about is belief in a higher force, in a force bigger than yourself. It's not necessarily a physical person. These people might think at the time, especially the elderly, they probably believe that um, it's going to come in a physical form. And whatever they believe, nobody should dispute it because you're not supposed to put a stumbling block in people's paths. Because what happens is, is what people believe, that is what carries them through. And some people, when they are going through hard times, if they didn't believe that Jesus was going to come and rescue them, then they wouldn't be able to get through each day. But I don't believe that these same people are sitting around doing nothing. Because God isn't a passive God and he doesn't have passive me messengers and he doesn't have passive children. So whilst it might seem to the rest that people are just sitting there waiting for God to res rescue them, God only helps those who help themselves. And that goes without saying in anything you do, you'll find that sometimes you'll put something off and you want to do something and you're like, oh, I can't be asked. I'm not going to bother with this. You know what I mean? You, you kind of either wait for somebody else to do it and you find that, you know, you're just getting frustrated and you'll kind of say, oh, God, help me to do it. Why doesn't he help me to do it? And then you'll find that when you say, Ch I'm going to do it myself because you get so frustrated, you'll find that all the forces come together to help you fulfill whatever it is that you've started. But you have to start it first. So it's no point sitting around thinking, oh, God's going to come down and rescue you and you're not doing anything. Anyway, that's my two cents worth. 
Um, that is where you have to go. But as long as you find yourself in a state of mind where you looking for somebody to come and rescue you, you have to move off of the rescue mentality. That is the thing that is killing us. We are we are living off our rescue mentality. Look here. The preacher don't even have a mess rescue mentality in a church. Because when he want money for what he do, who him ask? He don't ask God, him ask you, the congregation, and you provide that money for him. Right, right. But him tell you, when you go to him and say, Pastor, you know so my situation is bad. Me, me, my wife and my pity, they're hungry. Me can't say that. He said, go down to God and you need to pray hard and you need to have more faith. But you never ask him, say, but how come when you want money to do your things, you come to us? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Okay, so he's talking about pastors now asking for money and how, you know, they're, they're well off and yet when you want money from the pastor, he doesn't give it to you. The thing is with um, pastors, there's good and bad pastors all over the world. And it's funny, when you're going to a church, you don't ask a pastor for his credentials. You know, if you're going to employ anyone, you normally have an interview with them, you find out their history, you find out where they've worked before, and all that kind of stuff. But when you go into a church, you see people in there, you don't know where this pastor has come from, you don't know how credible he is, you don't know his background, well not all the time, sometimes people have pastors who they've known from growing up, that is totally different. But I'm talking about people who go into a new church where there's a pastor who they don't know and they just assume that he's a credible pastor or pastor of good standing. I'm not knocking pastors, but all I'm saying is that who where does he, who shows us his credentials? I mean, no anybody can speak to people, anybody can quote from the Bible, but we do not know individuals' credentials. We do know what their past is. We do not know what their motive is. And even if they are genuine pastors, we don't know what their motive is for being a pastor. Supposing their motive is for greed. Supposing their motive is to get rich. Supposing their motive is to have power and influence. We don't know what pastor's motivated motivations is, but it doesn't mean you're not God for that. This is an individual situation. And um, it's like when people give their tithes or they give all this money. You know, when you think about it, 10% of some of these salaries is a lot of money. I mean, I know you have your little um, stub probably on your check um, that you pay out. Or maybe you put down your debit card details, so I guess you have a receipt that way of where the money has gone. But do you get, is it accounted for at the end of the year? Do you get a midterm review? Do, does the pastor show you what he's done with the money? Do you get an accounts receivable and the disbursements and everything that where the money that the people have put in has gone? Like, so, for example, does it show <clears throat> a statement? Does it show how much for rent, how much for gas, how much for electricity? How, I don't know if they pay staff, but how much are for staff, how much for refreshments, you know, how much for outings? They should have a um, an account, accounting process where people can actually see where the money is going so people don't get ripped off and people don't think that it's because they see the pastor driving around in a Mercedes or the latest Range Rover or a house on the hill and get their bees in a bonnet because they feel that they're putting all this money in the church and they're left without nothing. If you want to give all your money to the church and you're left without nothing, well that's your problem. God doesn't suffer fools gladly. And I remember going to a church once and I never went back because what they said, there was a lot of young people in the congregation and the, the minister or the pastor said to them, um, your, your, your tithes come first. You don't pay your bills until you pay your tithes. And I thought, what kind of advice is that? That is not good advice. Tithes are not mandatory, you know, but they make it mandatory in the church. And that is why a lot of people are falling out of the church. A lot of people are in debt. I remember my daughter was in debt when she used to go to church because every month they were asking her for money and they put her on some kind of guilt trip. 
But the fact of the matter is, you don't have to pay tithes. Your tithes can be in your service, what you do physically for other people. So, and technically, the 10% that they take out of your salary each month, that could be your tithes because that goes out to the community. It goes out to government. It goes out to DWP for universal credit. It goes towards pensions. So that could be your tithes. So who says you have to give another 10% in the church? Anyway, that's just my thoughts. I'm not saying that you don't pay tithes. It's up to each individual. But I'm talking about those people who are being forced to pay tithes over and above their bills. Their bills comes first because if they don't pay their mortgage, if they don't pay their rent, they're not going to have a place to live. And that church is not going to put them in a home. So you have to be sensible. That's what I'm saying is that is where we have to start to think for ourselves and to know that you are the only one that can fix your problem. The pastor cannot fix it for you. There is no God in the sky to fix it for you because every decision that you make, if no God make it decision, and you make the decision. And not the devil make the decision, and you make the decision. He, he, they give you those things, you see, to use as a crutch. Devil, God, and Jesus is a crutch. <laughs> That you may never get out of the state that you find yourself in. Because I have, if you show me in a, in, a, in, a, in a ruling class world where they ever say, okay, boy, you know, the, these people come from the Middle East and blow them with building, we have a wheel pan God to come and take care of the problem. When do? In send any a hands amount of plane, even though when was the 9 11 didn't go the way them do. Because they set up their own thing and do their own thing. But I'm just showing you. Any time that you hear them say somebody did something to the United States of America, look at the amount of bomb and the amount of plane that is going down there to get to kill mass amount of people. Dog, rat, puss, anything them catch them killing. So those people that sell you a religion give you these things and you and me believe in them. The problem is that we are not we are not sitting down and analyze that say, something here doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. So he's now talking about, first of all, I wanted to talk again, go back to people of the church. We also have to think about the congregation. Why are they going to the church? Are they going to the church um, to look good? Are they going to church to feel superior? Are they going to the church so that they can say, um, are they going to church? Some people go to church for looking a partner. People go to church for all different reasons. So we also have to not only think about the pastor, we have to think about the congregation. There's a lot of people in the congregation that give people who, who are believers a bad name because they tend to call them hypocrites. And that's because also because um, people outside the church or people outside religion see people who are going to the church as you know, they're supposed to be holier than thou. They're supposed to be perfect. They're not supposed to make any mistakes. So you find them calling them hypocrites and parasites and all kinds of names. But the fact of the matter is, is that people who believe in God do not necessarily, are not necessarily, are not perfect. No one is perfect. So if somebody goes to church and they're not behaving in a certain way, yes, you could call them a hypocrite because they are supposed to be following the ways of God. But at the same time, you know, your expectations for somebody who's going to the church might be too high. And also those people who are going to the church, we don't know what their motives are. So when you see people going to the church, not everybody who says, Lord, is, is, is of God. So you, you can't just assume that people who go to church, every one of them is holy, is, you know, is good, is virtuous and all of these kind of things. So it's about putting that in balance. Now, going back to the rust, and he was talking about how um, when they did that 9-11 and, you know, they sent out bombs and all sorts. But it's almost like he believes that, Christians just sit there and wait for things to happen and um, well I don't even if he's talking about Christians because at one point he's talking about all different kinds of religions but the fact of the matter is it's not like I said the children of God are not passive and if you remember I don't know how many of you who are watching this are believers or who read the Bible but in Joshua um, you know he, God wiped out everybody man woman and child 
because, you know, they were disobedient, they were disrespectful, they, they just were over the top. He just wiped out everybody. So he's going on like, you know, God is sitting around producing all these passive people and these people are allowing themselves to be scapegoated. But the fact of the matter is, one thing he said is that we're all responsible for our decisions that we make. And yes, that is true. We can't sit around waiting for things to happen. We have to be responsible for our life choices. And it's no point waiting till you're 50 and 60, even though that's what some people do. And then you've had all your, you've made poor life choices. You've made poor decisions and you haven't taken advantage of opportunities. And then you blame it on God because you've got squat, because you haven't got anything. That doesn't make sense either. Now, if you're saying, OK, I've, you know, I've worked all this way, I've worked hard, I've invested, I've used my talents for this and I've used my talents for that. And I've, you know, I've been really working and then, you know, I haven't been blessed. That's totally different. But, you know, under the grand scheme of things, if you work hard, dilig diligently and are passionate about what you do and you're helping other people, you are supposed to get that step further up the ladder. But you can't expect to sit back, think, you know, you're not doing anything and God's going to come and rescue you and God's going to come and lift you out of the miry clay. That ain't happening. That's not happening. Um, what else was I going to say? Okay, let's go back to this. I wanted to quote you. Um, which one is it? Oh, it was Joshua 8, um, verses 1 to 19. God does say, don't be timid and don't hesitate. So, you know, some people, they, you know, it's like from the moment of time, people read the Bible. Ten people could read the Bible. Ten people would get a different interpretation. And like, you know, language changes over the years. From the beginning of time, language has changed. Terms change. Definitions have changed. And we witness it. When you think about now, even now, I remember when my dad used to say, kiss my neck. They don't say kiss my neck anymore. They say something else. And they used to call lolly. Lolly was money. Now it might be dosh, it might it used to be dough, then it's um, bread and you know, they call it all different kinds of names. And as even more modern times, we had men, we have women, now we have transgender, we have trans age, we have this, we have that, we have gender identification, we have gender, um, oh, uh, we have so many names. We have black, white, Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean, you know, um, what else they call us, coloreds, and all of those names change over the years. So when who, who, we've never seen the original Bible, all we've seen is interpretations of it. And when you get interpretations of it, it's each person is interpreting it based on their own individual experiences. And when you think the people who wrote the Bible were witnessing what they saw, and then you've got people who didn't see what they saw interpreting it in the language that they understand, it's bound to get distorted. So what happens now is people select what they want out of the Bible and they use it to suit themselves. And that's not what God is saying. You know, we were never meant to be um, an idle people, you know, a subservient people. You know, God's people aren't like that. So anyway, let me go back to what he's saying. Sense because if it did make sense, things would have been better. Just like they give you religion. For instance, look on Jamaica. Jamaica have more church per capita than any place else. How come? You have so much, so much things happening there. And I'm not telling you sometimes the news that you're getting, it's not necessarily true. But what I'm saying is, even in Jamaica, when they're talking about people getting killed, it's gang killing gang. People who are involved in scamming, killing each other because they're not sharing the money correctly amongst themselves. Whether it's police or whatever, a lot of people are involved in it. Whether it's business people, a lot of them is involved in the scamming money. What I'm saying is that if church... Was, why is it that you, you don't have one religion if religion was something to unite man? Why is it that you have the Catholic and not agree with the Jehovah's Witness and the Seventh-day Adventist not agree with the Jehovah's Witness and the Baptist not agree with the Jehovah's Witness and the Anglican not agree with the Jew and, and all of them don't agree with each other but at the end of the day what all of them is 
Well, I don't know why he thinks religion um, is meant to unite everyone. It's not meant to unite anyone. The thing is, from the moment God gave us free will, that's when everything went tits up. And that is why there are so many religions, because people have free will. People have the freedom to choose. And because they have the freedom to choose, they have the freedom to create, they have the freedom to be whoever they want, they have the freedom to choose whatever God they want to choose. And that's why there's, you know, there's free will. So it's got nothing to do with discrediting God because... You know, it seems to conflict. But like I said, depending on how, on how you interpret the Bible, determines on what you get out of it. Anyway, let's go back. Is the God up in the sky we are serve. And it is the same Jesus we are rescuing. So something wrong with that picture. So until we move ourselves from underneath that, that's why I said, show me. This is man in Jamaica. You know what he said? He curse God every day. And the people I mean, in the community, I'm, I'm serious thing I'm telling you, right. the people I mean, in the community say, oh this man is, this man is wicked and, and God and Jesus are going to do this. No, this man here, in, in the community that he lives, he have the best house, he have the nicest vehicle, and his life is prosperous. Right. Right? So my point... Okay, let's get back to this. Now he's saying this man curses God every day. Why is he cursing God every day? It doesn't sound like he's a happy man. Just because he's prosperous and he's got money doesn't mean he's happy. And people equate happiness with money. But money doesn't always bring you happiness. So, you know, I don't think that that makes any sense at all. You know, and that is what he's definitely doing. He's equating happiness and blessings with materialism. Having material wealth. And we all know that people... You know, even most of the, you know, when they talk about people who are rich, you have to remember people who are rich, they have a sense of power. They have a sense of influence. They're not accountable to people a lot of the times because they can pay their way out of situations. And because of that, they have less empathy and money changes hearts. Money changes people. And that's why it's called the root of all evil. Not because money itself is sinful. It's the way it affects your mentality when you have it. And you all know people who are, you know, who don't have anything one minute and then they have, um, they have, they win the lottery the next. You know, their lifestyle changes, the way they react to people changes. Everything changes about them. So that is why they're saying money is the root for all evil. If you manage money and you are um, generous with it and it doesn't change your disposition and you're still um, humble, you know, that's a totally different, that's a totally different ball game. Because when you think about Solomon, he was rich and David, he was rich. Job, they were rich, but they had a humble spirit. So it's not about, you know, being poor. It's about being poor in spirit, which is, t is a different analogy than what the one the Russ is making. But like I said, this is just my opinion. I'm not a connoisseur of the Bible, by the way. It is that. Why don't you, for, for instance, listen, sit this guy aside? Because... If you poor and you are suffer every day, that means you curse. You see what I'm saying? You have to stop believing that it's only poor people that accept. Because that's what church teach you, that's what Bible teach you, that it's only poor people that accept. No, but, but uh, what I'm saying is though, that's what he teach. I, I don't disagree with you, but what I'm saying, that's not what the Bible teach. He said, blessed are the poor. You see what I say? Because these things, they are going to see God. And he said, it is if a camel go through the high of a needle and a rich man to enter in high kingdom. Not me saying a rich people. Then who come Solomon with them? Say Solomon was the richest man. But that's the thing, you see, when I say people extract parts out of the Bible and they don't complete the sentence. God doesn't say blessed are the poor. He said blessed are the poor in spirit. And that is where that humility comes in. And when he's talking about it's easier for a 
for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the, the gates of heaven. He's talking about the mentality of people when people have money. It changes them. It changes their disposition. And we know from experience even now how the rich are treating us. They don't give a toss about us. You know, they, they, they've already made their heaven wherever it is. They've already got their escape route. They don't care about us. So that's why he's saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Because when you're rich, a lot of people, it changes their disposition. Now you have people like Akon, totally different. You have somebody like R. Johnson, who paid for all those guys' um, colleges, um, you know, the funds in the colleges, he paid all their, sorry, college tuitions and paid all their loans and everything. You have people who are rich who are generous and magnanimous. But he's talking, that's why he said it's easier. He's not knocking people who are rich because, like he said, Solomon was rich. Solomon was also generous. So, you know, you have to put it into context. You can't take these things out of context and then start spreading stuff like this to make it look like God is, you know, if you believe in God, it's a conflict. And I'm not telling people, you know, that, you know, I'm not trying to change anybody. I'm not here to convert anyone. I'm just kind of responding to what this man is saying. I get the man that was a good friend. David was a, was a man, he killed people, he brutalized people, he take their money and all them kind of thing there. And at the same time, he said, he was a man after God won out. You see what I say? These people are stripping down people and God say love them. Then how come me, when I do none of those things and I kill people? How come God no love me? God, God no show me no sign say love me, he not provide me with all these riches. <laughs> and he must say, God has said to me, say, be careful becoming rich because if you come rich, you have, a, you have, a, you have a regret, you have, a, you have left me. That God no good because he didn't create the world and he didn't create an imbalance in the world. Right? It's an imbalance because if God in fear. Okay. So what he's calling imbalance is the um, law of opposites. You have to have rich. If you don't have rich, you can't have poor. If you can't have poor, you can't have rich. You know what I mean? You can't have greedy without being not greedy. You can't have one thing without the other. So there has to be imbalance. You have to have the poor and the, and the rich. Well, you, how do you know that God says, says those words when it was written by a man? Well, that's what I'm saying is that this God we didn't tell you about do exist. Because the fact is, what I'm saying is that, look here, every book that you have is a man write it. Every book. So if you ask the question now, say, okay, every book that that, that, that man tell me about their God, when did him and God have that conversation? And who witnessed that conversation that him and God have to tell him, say, they, they didn't give him it in a Spanish, they didn't give it in a, in a Portuguese, they didn't give it in a English, and what language did God give him, give him this thing into that? No, I think that's a bit... I think that's a bit off the wall, that statement, because even people who write books now, they write, a lot of people write it based off of inspiration. You know, nobody tells us what to write, but some people, you get an inspiration, like I've got a book called The Spirit of Queens, and I was inspired to write that. I don't know by whom or whatever, but the words just flowed into my head, and I wrote the book. I wrote, Well, it's not really a book, it's a book of phrases. But my point is, is that the people who wrote the Bible are people who was inspired and who witnessed what was happening. And so they wrote it in their words at that time. So you can't account for what's happened since that book was written. I heard there's a book called the Maccabee Bible. I had it once. I don't know what happened to it. But that's supposed to be the original Bible. But the point is, is that it's told to, it is going to be different. And it doesn't mean that you discredit it. It just means that you have to kind of use your common sense and try to translate it into a way that you can understand it if you want to use it as a reference. It's, you know, when you think about people like Miles Monroe, he is so 
brilliant. It's only a shame he died. But he's so brilliant at bringing the Bible into the present and making it relevant for today. A lot of pastors can't do that. And, you know, you have people who go back into history and they're trying to relate to it as then, which is quite confining. And, you know, and that is where I think this RAS is now in talking about, you know, what language did he write it in and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't really matter what language he wrote it in, because even if he wrote it today, it would be translated in different languages for other countries to understand. And it would be interpreted in a way that the person who is interpreting makes sense of it. So the thing is that is you have to realize, so look here, all of these things are make up story. All of these things are make up story. Look here, do you know that in the African language, there's no concept, there, there's no word for Jesus, there's no word for Satan, there's no word for none of those things in the African language. They, 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 they don't exist. It's only since the European come and bring those concepts there, you know, really turn around the African spirituality and, and flip it on him, the trick him, in order for him to have a belief system instead of a knowing system that's where the difference come in so that's what i'm saying now we gotta stop believing we need to know because believe believe mean that you do not know and you are not sure that's what it means that's not what believe means believe does not mean that you do not know and you do not sure you you're, you're not sure what a load of crap that's not what believe when people believe they actually just believe it based on their circumstances, based on their experiences, based on their values. That's why people believe. Okay, what is faith? If a man tell us that faith is a sure expectation of things that has never been seen. Why me want to have an expectation of things that I never see? That is where the faith is. You see what I'm saying? So. But the thing is, is that we do a lot of things on faith. When you enter into a relationship, you enter that relationship on faith. You meet somebody, you don't know that person from Adam, do you? For the first time when you meet somebody, you, meet, you don't know that person from Adam. You don't know anything about their background. You just decide that you're going to work with that person. And you can become emotionally involved with that person. And some people have marriages that last for years. And when they get married, they marry on faith that that marriage is going to last a very long time. And that is an expectation, but not something you can foresee in the future. But you do it based on faith. So, you know, you have to have faith. And if people have faith in God or whatever it is they believe in, it's not for anyone to take that away from them because that is their lifeline. And to take it and, you know, God says you mustn't put a stumbling block in, in, you know, in somebody's path when it comes to their faith. Because, you know, people need something to believe in, whatever it is. Some people believe in alcohol. Some people have believe in drugs. But whatever it is, people believe in God, allow them. I don't fear nothing because I know, I don't, and, and as long as I am in knowing, I don't need to fear anything. Fear is for things that you don't know, you, you know, oh man, I fear this thing because I, I don't know what it's going to do to me. No, I know that a snake is going to, is going to sting me. It, anyhow I go to, it, the snake is going, I don't fear the snake. I have respect for the snake because the fact is that I know that the snake can pose danger to me. I don't fear the lion. It's the fact that I know that the lion can pose. So I don't go in the way of the lion. Some man now, like white man is always, you want to stick him out in the iron head in the alligator mouth to prove that the alligator now go bite him. I don't need to do that because why I need to prove that? I know the, the, the capability of the alligator or the capability of the lion or the capability of a cobra snake. So why do I want to play with the cobra snake and things say, okay, one day now it now go hit me. So it's just what I'm saying is that you have to know. You know good and you know bad. You choose to do either. It is no devil telling you, oh, do that thing over yourself. And God has said, no, no, do that thing over yourself because if you do that thing, no. Both forces were created in order to create balance. It is up to you as the individual to deal with it and to balance it all for yourself. Nobody's going to balance it all for you. You must balance it. Learn balance. And once you learn the balance, then things will, you see your whole life change because you decide, okay, I get up today. You know what? 
I'm going to make sure today that I'm living under the concept of my heart that I'm not going to do any bad thing to anybody. Today is the day that I'm going to improve myself to be a better person. You see what I'm saying? Today is the day when I am going to do everything to change the, the dynamics of the situation of African people. That is what I, I, I must do. To show that I love people. Not in an yeah. emotional sense, but in a... Yeah, I totally agree with that. And that is exactly what I'm saying. But what he doesn't realize is that it takes... Uh, you have to have a moral compass to think that way. And a lot of times, people who are rich do not have a moral compass. And so that is why certain people are find themselves in certain situations. Sense where I know that in order for improvement, I must display this quality that is within me already. I don't need a Bible to tell me about love because I already know. It's in me. I don't need a Bible to tell me about hate. No, I already know. I know good and I know evil. Everybody that born on earth know that. You... Oh, it's finished. But also what I was thinking about, you know, a lot of uh, people, they don't seem to understand that prosperity is within themselves. You know, like he says, some people sit back and they're waiting for God to rescue them. Like I said in another video, we're all seed bearing fruit. That is us. We all have something within us that can help us to prosper. Whatever, whether it's talent, whatever it is. I mean, you see people who paint and they make money from their painting. You see DJs, they go out and play and they make money from playing their music and they become specialists. You see doctors, they become specialists in their field and then they get paid for it. We all have seeds of greatness within us. And so it's not about waiting for somebody to come down and bless you. And if you've spent your life just um, living a life and just having children and concentrating on your family and doing the minimum and maybe just doing a little hustle there and a little hustle there to bring in a little enough bacon to, to look after your family, you can't expect to be rich. You know, because rich means sacrifice. Rich means dedication. And sometimes you can't even have a family if you want to be rich. Or you have to have somebody who understands that these are the sacrifices. Some women, they don't see their husband for weeks, for months, you know. But that is a sacrifice if they want their husband to come back rich. But some people don't want to make those sacrifices. Some people want to stay home and, you know, be with their family and, you know, and that's fine, you know, but then they can't expect to not take those risks and expect to be prosperous. It doesn't work that way. With everything you do, there's a risk to be taken. And so, therefore, you know, if you have something within you and you're not exploiting it, it's no point sitting back and saying, oh, woe is me. You know, there's no God because oh, look at me, I'm here and I haven't got anything and I'm a good person. I don't go around killing anybody. That's not what it's about. It's about exploiting your talents and making money from it. But, you know, a lot of people, they don't understand that. They don't understand it. Anyway, um, and I always also put love of others means to guide and counsel and to nurture. Um, yeah, people of today are more intelligent and literate and sensible. And they can interpret the Bible and they can interpret in a way that gives them strength and courage if, that, if they want to use the Bible as a reference. They don't have to pick out all the negative aspects of the Bible or the aspects that the slave master gave them because that is those are the parts he's picking out. But they were taken out for a reason. And people, you know, the slave master, of course, he wanted to be wealthy. He wanted to control a race of people. So he is going to extract. And especially when those slaves, they, were, they weren't taught to read and write. And I mean, I think there were a few rebels who started teaching them to read. But the majority of them couldn't read and write. They took what was said in the Bible. They took what the, what the slave master said was in the Bible as being fact and as being truth and they interpreted the bible the way they wanted to to serve them 
So the same way the slave masters can take the Bible to serve them, so can the enslaved take the Bible to build up their strength. And a lot of times the verses in the Bible were what gave them strength, what gave them motivation. So, you know, I don't think you can knock it one way or another. Each to their own is what I say. Um, I think people should look at their lives, evaluate the mistakes that they've made and the missed opportunity and ask whether it's their fault or God's fault. Because everybody looks for someone to blame when things go tits up. Um, and here endeth the first lesson. Bye for now. Your, your comments would be valuable.